afternoon to each one of you. A very warm welcome to the first event of Professor X Paradigm 2015, the preface talk by Dr. Sunil Mukhi, titled A World of Magnets and Miracles. Now, before we move on, we would like to show you all a short unveiling video about the speaker lineup we have for Professor X, the public lecture series of Paradigm 2015 this year. Beyond the horizon of the place we lived when we were young, in a world of magnets and miracles, our thoughts strayed constantly and without boundary, the ringing of the division bell had begun. When David Gilmour penned the lyrics of the song, he perhaps meant to indicate the differences between our human experience and our true nature to which we will be returning as one being very soon. Tools of modern science have helped us understand a great deal about the remarkable universe in which we live. Though robust and precise, our understanding is incomplete, which motivates us to probe deeper. In this talk, Mr. Sunil Mukhi will emphasize the dual role of experimental and theoretical physics in rendering the universe comprehensible, thus elucidating that fundamental physics can be thought of as a living dialogue between magnets and miracles. Mr. Mukhi is an ex-Xavierite. He earned a PhD in theoretical physics from the State University of New York at Stony Brook. After spending two years at the International Center for Theoretical Physics at Trieste, Italy, he returned to India, where he has worked at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai. He joined the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, Pune, as the head of physics department in November 2012, and his major publications deal with fundamental properties of string theories. Mr. Mukhi is a fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences and the Indian National Science Academy, and a recipient of the prestigious S.S. Bhatnagar Award. He has been an editor of the Journal of High Energy Physics since its inception, and has been a speaker at the three editions of the Strings International Conference and was, organi was an organizer of the Mumbai edition of the prestigious conference. Apart from, <coughs> mis apart from uh, physics, Mr. Mukhi is passionate about Indian classical music and has spent considerable effort archiving classical recordings, particularly those of no notable vocal artist Pandit Kumar Gandharva. He also maintains a blog on the same name, Tantu Jal. I would now like to invite Mr. Mukhi on stage. Uh, and also, I would like to request all of you all to please keep your mobile phones on silent. Uh, our, our officers are present across the venue, so any questions uh, that you all want to ask to Mr. Mukhi can be addressed uh, using chips, and be, they shall be forwarded. 
to Mr. Mukhe. Uh, thank you so much.
pointer or otherwise I yeah. So not all these particles are equally familiar. These are electrons and quarks might be photons, might be more familiar muons and neutrinos which we'll talk about, but you probably haven't experienced any direct impact from them. Uh, electrons are the ones from which you are most likely experienced an impact if you put your finger in an electric socket. And photons, of course, are what light up this room and my, and my uh, presentation. Now, the properties of these particles are very, very accurately known. It's actually quite amazing how accurately these things are known. I'll be referring to precision repeatedly in this talk, but let me just say that if you only focus on the interaction between electrons and photons, uh, you can calculate things to eight decimal places and you can measure those things to eight decimal places and they agree to the eighth decimal place. And I think there's no comparison uh, with such accuracy in any branch of science whatsoever, including any other branch of physics. Again, not putting down anybody else, but as far as precision is concerned, uh, the point is that it didn't have to be this way because some of these formulae are not really tweakable. Once you have the formula, it's right or it's wrong. And once you know, once you test it to five decimal places, you don't do anything new to test it to eight decimal places. You just calculate more with the same formula, and you do experiment better with the same equipment or better equipment, and it still agrees. If it failed, the theory would sort of be dead at some point, but it's never failed. So that's quite remarkable. And we believe that all material phenomena in the universe arise from these particles and their interactions. One obvious disclaimer, that's not to say we can calculate all material phenomena. For example, what I'm going to say next cannot in any thinkable way be calculated by knowing all my fundamental particles and their interactions. So nobody ever claims that by knowing this, we really know all of science. Of course we don't. Of course, you know, biology has to be there, chemistry has to be there, solid state physics has to be there. These are not things that are answered. Now, a lot of people like to argue what it means to say in principle. So I don't want to get into that argument, but you can go on the net and you'll find a lot of, uh, a lot of slanging matches about this. So, okay. Now, despite this success that I just told you about, there's a lot that we don't know. And here are some of the questions one might ask to which we don't have answers. One is why are there so many different elementary particles? At last count, uh, you know, several dozen, and it depends on how you count in, in some way. There are some particles that have multiple attributes. You can count them as new particles or not. So, uh, but anyway, it's a few dozen, whichever way you look at it. Uh, have we discovered all the elementary particles? That's a certainly a question. Um, will we ever discover all the elementary particles? Also a question. And here's one which is sharply influenced by the one elementary particle that certainly exists, but we don't know what on Earth it is. In fact, it's not on Earth at all. It's out in space. Uh, this is the particle which makes up dark matter. Okay? By now, there's essentially no, except for a few, I think, slightly cranky people, there's really no debate that dark matter exists. Okay? The universe is full of it. The universe is full of more dark matter than any other kind of matter. So all the particles I listed on the previous slide make up I mean, they are different species, but the number of them existing in the universe is less than the total amount of dark matter by a factor of something like 10. So dark matter is there, and we have absolutely no idea, only speculation about what it might be. So it's obviously a very important open question. And there are many other open questions uh, in this, which I won't go into. Now, there was a lot of progress on these uh, questions, and uh, this, I'll, here I repeat what I started by saying, that it's questions like these that lead to big, big breakthroughs, which then later become part of one's daily lives. So I've just listed a few things that I think uh, all of you have had some familiarity with, or we have. Um, and these are examples of things that nobody seriously thought could be a reality, um, particularly, for example, the fact that, so the fact that there's a laser inside this, I mean, who, who knew? You know, laser was a, a bulky thing, I think uh, Professor Jangi Misti, who has taught me when I was a student here, knows better than anyone that in, you know even up to the 70s or 80s, a laser was a big, huge thing that you had to get a budget and spend years waiting to buy it and then not let anyone touch it and so on. You know, it was that precious. And now it's everywhere, it's in your pocket, it's, it can be, you know, you take it for granted. It's astounding. The actual discovery of the phenomenon of lasing, I think, was 1950s. 
So it's really a, you know it takes a long time before such a discovery turns into something uh, real that you can use. Okay. Now, uh, of course, elementary particles uh, are there. What is it that allows us to calculate uh, things which I referred to earlier? Uh, it's a theoretical framework that goes by the name of quantum field theory. Um, and actually, it's not much more than the basic ideas of quantum mechanics, but put in a form which can be applied to systems where particles are created or destroyed. The old quantum mechanics typically allowed you to study one particle and it, what it was doing or a few particles, but quantum field theory allows you to deal with processes, for example, where a particle of matter and antimatter collide and annihilate and give out some photons, that kind of process. And it unifies quantum mechanics and special relativity as it must. So this is the best framework we have. This is also, I think, the best textbook uh, we have uh, by Peskin and Schroeder, but there are others. Um, it's notoriously difficult. This is a fat uh, textbook, but uh, it's a, it's a really beautiful framework because uh, you know once you have it, you have enormous power to compute things that you can measure. Okay. So what are these fields that appear in quantum field theory? Well, fields encode the momentum and polarization modes of particles. So they, they encode what the particle is doing at a particular instant. And the field theory is like a numerical recipe. It's a computational recipe uh, to find out, given the particle in some state of momentum and some state of polarization, when two of them collide, what is the probability of getting different outcomes? Okay, so that's the kind of typical question from first, first principles, and I already said this, uh, it predicts things very accurately and they can be measured very accurately. And this, the comparison between these two makes us uh, really, it's really exciting. I cannot do justice to it in a short talk. You know, it's not just a comparison between one calculation and one experiment, but dozens of different calculations done over decades and dozens of experiments done over decades. Also the experiments, I think it's worth mentioning are done in different countries, different cultures, by people of different religions, you know. This is the place to look if you want to feel that the world is one universal thing and that we are unnecessarily divided among us. Just want to make that point once. Okay, good. Now, the actual model, field theory is a framework, the actual model which allows us to calculate these properties is called the standard model of particle physics. And it's amazingly precise. <coughs> Uh, and it looks very complete. And it makes use of a principle, uh, which is one of the few equations in my talk, is called the principle of gauge invariance. Uh, for those who know what this means, this represents the photon field, and this equation tells us that the photon field is unchanged if you add to it the gradient of a scalar function. And this very simple, almost harmless looking principle, uh, if you try to construct a theory based on it, you find uh, not only uh, electromagnetism, but also by generalizing this principle a little bit, you find the theory of weak nuclear interactions and the theory of strong nuclear interactions. So the underlying symmetry principle for all the, these three interactions uh, is gauge invariance. Now, uh, I, I've had this, uh, so some form of this talk I've been giving for the last 15 years, and I keep having to add a Nobel Prize to this list. <coughs> So not to take too much time because I think you can get all this off the net more easily. Uh, let me just show you some of the Nobel Prizes, uh, including the last two that I added after I started giving this talk uh, for discovering. So the last, of course, was, was uh, for the Higgs uh, mechanism. And there will be one more for the experimenters who discovered the Higgs particle. It's ob obvious that they have to get the Nobel Prize at some point. Um, likely they are waiting for those people to discover some more things so that they can give this one prize for many discoveries. That's how it the Nobel Committee always thinks like that. Uh, by the way, I'll tell you a fascinating thing about the Nobel Committee. Uh, it's not very difficult to meet uh, members of the Nobel Committee because they can be seen in institutes in, uh, in Europe. It's kind of by turns. I think you have to be Scandinavian or most people are Scandinavian, but you can meet them. And they are allowed to talk about what happened in the Nobel Prize uh, uh, committee meeting after a gap of some year, 30 years or 40 years or something like that. So it's so I've actually met one who was like, okay, so this one I can't talk about just yet, but in five years I can tell you what, uh, what, uh, what the debate was like. So, you know, people have uh, speculated what the debate was like over this project. That's, that's idle, idle speculation. Now, the important thing is that these are all bits and pieces. 
uh, as many experimental as theoretical, in fact more experimental, this one, this one, this one, this one, um, and uh, that's it actually. So these four were experimental, the first and last three theoretical, and there's still one more experimental away. Okay, so after all these prizes, you would think the model would basically be right, but no. It has its problems, and here are some of its problems. One of the problems is that um, it doesn't adequately describe the properties of neutrinos as we know them. Now, they are just one of the particles in the standard model. And um, the thing that was special about them for a long time, in all the, in fact, in all the textbooks, in those textbooks that were written at the time I was studying in college, is that they were exactly massless and traveled at the speed of light. Turns out, no. They are nearly massless and they travel nearly at the speed of light, but they are not exactly massless. But they are a billion times lighter than electrons, which we all thought were light now. So they are um, many orders of magnitude lighter than anything else, which is very strange and uh, very unnatural. And all we know about them prompts us to believe that for, for the each of these light neutrinos, there is an ultra heavy partner. Uh, which has a mass uh, maybe a billion, billion times heavier than any normal particle. And so neutrinos seem to occur in these ultra-light, ultra-heavy pairs, which is a bizarre, uh, it's called the seesaw mechanism. Of course, no one has proved this, but it's a bizarre thing and it's not something we understand. The standard model doesn't contain any information about dark matter particles for the simple reason we don't know what these particles are. We haven't actually been able to isolate a dark matter particle and find out a simple thing like what, what are its interactions, what is its spin, what is its charge, what is its nature, we don't know very much. All we know is that they form clumps which interact through the gravitational force. And these clumps or halos gather around galaxies. So when there are galaxies, there is dark matter around them. And it's dark in the sense it doesn't interact with light, but it's visible in the sense that it's, it gravitates. So its gravitational pull is as good as that of anything else. And the standard model doesn't describe gravity. So that's one force that's left out of the standard model and completely, as far as we know, out of the framework of quantum field theory for reasons of consistency, which I'll return to. Now, there are a couple more complaints about the standard model which depend a little on your point of view. Uh, one is that it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't predict, it's supposed to be a first principles model, but it doesn't tell you that inevitably you have to have uh, six types of leptons, one of which is the electron, one is the muon, one is the tau lepton, there are three neutrinos. Why six? Why not nine? Why not eleven, fifteen, or just two? And uh, there's an old question associated to this called who ordered the muon? When people discovered the muon, it turned out to be just like an electron but a couple of hundred times heavier. It didn't make any sense that it was there. It didn't seem to serve any purpose being there. Okay, but it's there. So, this is a question people ask, you know, why does the standard model not tell us this? And finally, uh, the forces that are described in this, the electromagnetic, the weak and the strong nuclear interactions, uh, are not unified, although they all follow from the same gauge principle, they are not actually unified. You have to write the one model of one force plus the other plus the third and add them up. It's a kind of artificial. So, these are some of the limitations. And uh, in particular, I think I've already said this. Uh, so Ra it was Ravi who said, who ordered the new one? Uh, so one can't predict why the strengths of the forces are what they are. One just has to say, okay, that's a parameter, I measure it and I put it in. Um, there's a difference, by the way. For example, electromagnetism is a unified theory of electricity and magnetism. Okay, And here what happens is that magnetism is understood today to be nothing but electricity in motion. Whenever you have charges in motion, you get magnetism, okay? And that sets up a relation between the electric and magnetic fields which you can't violate, which the theory predicts and which experiment confirms. So that kind of unification we don't have. Uh, there is a partial unification. So for those who like mathematics, uh, there are these three uh, groups called Lie groups. These are mathematical constructions, SU3, SU2, and U1. And uh, the strong nuclear forces use this. And the weak nuclear forces and electromagnetism use some combination of these two. Uh, so there's, but you see, there's a x in the middle, which means we have to multiply these groups. Again, it's not a single group, but a product of these. So there's no common order. Okay. 
So that's my summary of what we know till now. Uh, let's go a little beyond the horizon. And uh, let's recall that Einstein was long bothered by the fact that electromagnetism and gravitation seem to be two totally different forces. These were the only two known and in his time when he was working. And it's interesting, uh, if you're physics students, you know that both follow the inverse square law. Okay? Uh, so that's why should both follow the same law. Today we understand that part of it better. It's because their force carriers are massless and any, any force whose force carriers are massless will satisfy the inverse square law. But Einstein wanted more than that. He wanted to unify them into a string, single force. And today if we ask the same question, then we have actually four different forces. Gravitation, electromagnetism, weak and strong nuclear force. It would be nice if all of these could be thrown to emerge from a single common force. Now, how can four different forces which have different manifestations and behaviors, how could they emerge from a single common force? What does it mean that unification could take place? Just to speculate such a thing, what could we mean? For this, uh, there's a very key notion which I think for you may be the most interesting or important uh, point that I'm trying to make in this talk, <laughs> is that field theories and more generally all of physics depends on the energy scale at which we observe it. And the nature of physics itself changes with the energy scale of the problem you're studying. The standard model is correct at present day energies, but at much higher energies, which we haven't been able to reach yet, it could mutate into a different and possibly unified theory. So that's the proposal that there could be a unified theory uh, which contains the standard model within it. So uh, for that I've shown you a logarithmic scale of typical energies, 1 giga electron volts to 1000 giga electron volts is about what the standard model is good for. Beyond that, as you see, there are lots of other energy scales up to 10 to the 19 GeV which has a special significance and our knowledge about that is essentially nothing, nothing, and nothing, okay? So in this world, if you think of this as the scale of the knowledge we would like to have, that's what we know, and it works at that range of energies. That's what we don't know, and we also don't have any experiments at this range of energies. So there's a huge, much huger amount of ignorance than of knowledge, if you have to be, if we have to be modest, if we are not modest, okay? Uh, this is the scale associated to quantum gravity and it will play a role a little bit in what I think. Okay, so here's one possibility and it's a very beautiful one. Nobody works on it anymore. It was fashionable in the 80s uh, pretty much and after that people didn't have any more new ideas in this direction and this graph I'm showing you is taken from the 80s. Uh, it's very good to pay attention to things that ideas that have run some course and died because after being dead for some time, they typically come back. So I wouldn't be surprised if this is back in the next five or 10 years, maybe longer. So what's the idea? Well, at the end, these are the energies we live at, remember. These are the energies where we do experiments. The strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force and the electromagnetic force have different strengths. This one is the highest, that's why we call it the strong force. It's stronger than the other forces. It's the one which binds quarks inside and protons and neutrons to form nuclear. But a theoretical calculation shows that this should get weaker with energy while these two get stronger with energy till at around 10 to the 17 GeV their strength seems to meet. Now this is an extrapolation based on assuming that absolutely nothing surprising happens between here and there which is you know people always wonder how we can be so bold. But the fact that these three curves meet at a point is rather uh, striking. It's, most people think it's not really a coincidence. Certainly I think it's not a coincidence. Okay. Now, if this is true, then it could happen that at this energy, this group of symmetries of the uh, standard model is subsumed into a single larger Lie group and this one is a possibility, SO10, which nicely contains all of these. <coughs> So the idea is that within this, there would be no difference between quarks and leptons, between photons and W bosons, gluons. They would all be somehow unified into a single symmetry structure. And that's a kind of goal of unification. Now there's another interesting approach, and Einstein was particularly excited by this approach in his lifetime. Uh, and this is a radical idea suggesting that space-time itself, or space particularly, might be higher than three dimensions. 
Now in our lives, of course, you know that we can either move forward, backward, which is one dimension, or left, right, which is another, or up, down. Okay? And there is no fourth direction perpendicular to all these three that we can move in. But uh, the speculation, and the speculation is early 20th century, uh, by a Polish physicist called Theodor Kaluza and a German called Klein, uh, that space-time might actually have more dimensions than what we see, and that at low energies, we experience only 3 plus 1 dimensions, but you might, by high energy probes, be able to see the extra ones. So, uh, of course, at this stage, you're wondering why one would speculate this, and I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, the way that you can understand this is, imagine I had a cylindrical surface and I was a little insect living on it. Uh, if the cylinder was very narrow, it would look like a tube, like a wire, let's like say an electrical wire or a thread, and the insect could walk forward and backward, but wouldn't recognize that there's another direction it can move in. But if the radius of that other direction is large, then the insect would realize that, well, it can go there. No, moreover, after it's gone round, it comes back to the same place. Okay? And so the point is that at low energies, less than the typical inverse radius of this, you cannot be sure whether such an extra dimension is there or not. Only if you have access to very high energy or very fine probes, then you can be sure. And this is the reason why today we cannot be sure whether our space is three-dimensional or four, five, or six-dimensional. Okay. Uh, probably I didn't have, don't have a slide on why this idea was nice. The observation of these gentlemen was that if we assume we have four space dimensions, we are living in four space dimensions, one of which is a circle like this, and we write down a theory purely of gravity in that higher dimension, and then we ask how would it appear to us in our three space dimensions, then a simple calculation, which a student can actually perform, uh, who knows Einstein's, uh, Lagrange, the Lagrange of Einstein's gravity, uh, shows that the higher dimensional gravity gives me lower dimensional gravity plus electromagnetism. So, uh, in fact, this is a potentially unifying idea between electricity, electromagnetism and gravity. Okay? This idea in its naive form can't be right because it also predicts other things which are not observed. But it's a rather beautiful thing thought that in a higher dimension you have less variety and when you come down to the lower dimensions you find all the complexity and variety that we actually observe. Now, the third idea which is the most radical is that at high energies or at very short distances, particles may not really be particle-like. Now, I want to emphasize that elementary particles are anyway not particle-like. If you would zoom into them as close as you could with uh, uh, an electron microscope or some better microscope, you would not see a little dot sitting there like the kind of dot I can put in PowerPoint in the middle of my page. Okay? You would see a fuzzy thing which is kind of flickering and buzzing around because it obeys the laws of quantum mechanics. And what we are saying is that that flickering, buzzing thing may not be sort of roundish, but might actually have a string-like structure at very short distances. And so the proposal is that when we are able to see it very closely, the quark, which we think of as a point, might actually be string-like, like this. Now again, why would we think such a thing? Well, this is the miracles part of my talk, and I'll now try to explain what this way of thinking about particles uh, achieves. So I gave you three ideas. One was that there is, um, so one was extra dimension, one was unification, one was extra dimensions, and one was strings. And I'll try to argue that these three are not that different. Um, and it's, it's quite a remarkable fact. You see, I just gave you three, three ideas that came from combining some experimental facts and theoretical speculations. But I'll now try to convince you that all of them are part of a common structure. There's actually one structure which gives us unification and extra dimensions and indeed strings. So for that, let me uh, make a little uh, detour and talk about uh, a symmetry called supersymmetry, which, is post which has been postulated. In fact, uh, so I went for my PhD in 76. That's the year, essentially, that the first a paper was written at least in the West. Later it turned out that there were some less known papers written in the Soviet Union in 74 on supersymmetry. So that's around the time the idea came. And um, it's the supersymmetry today is the second goal of the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva. It's 
first goal was to find the heads, its second goal is to find supercells. I'll try if I can briefly to explain what it is and why it's proposed. First of all, it requires bosons and fermions to exist in pairs. Some of the particles we know like photons uh, or like W bosons or like the Higgs uh, are bosonic particles and others that we know like the electrons and quarks are fermionic. They differ in their spin and they differ in their statistics. And they differ in many of their physical uh, qualities and they don't appear to have much relation to each other but in supersymmetry for the first time there is a pairing between bosons and fermions and the way it's often depicted is that if these are the particles we know above this mirror then uh, they, each of them has a, has a partner which is of the opposite type and the reason why these partners are drawn a little bit fatter and heavier uh, I'll explain in a minute. So of course before doing anything else people like to give them fanciful names so because of supersymmetry, you put an S in front of the name uh, of the particle. So a quark should have a partner called the squark and so on. Okay. And in fact, uh, yeah, anyway. Uh, so the squark is one of the sort for particles at the uh, Hadron Collider and I'll, I'll come to that. Now, why is supersymmetry required? It's required to protect the standard model from a potential instability. In any field theory, Quantum effects usually force the particle's mass to drift towards the highest observable scale. Now the highest scale for us should be the scale of gravity. I showed you that long table with 10 to the 19 GV at the end. And the puzzle therefore is not why there is a scale like 10 to the 19 GV, but why is there a scale like 1 GV at all? Why are not all elementary particles as heavy as 10 to the 19 GV? And if that was true, then of course nothing that we know would exist. There would not be light electrons or uh, quarks or any other thing. There would be no protons, no atoms, no molecules that we could, uh, you know, and therefore no us in particular. So uh, obviously some kind of miracle is happening which cancels this uh, behavior of quantum field theory uh, in which particle masses are quantum corrected to go to the highest scale. And it's called the hierarchy problem. Because it's the hierarchy problem is why is there such a high scale and such a low scale? Any one of them would have made sense, but having both scales in physics is very puzzling. And um, it is effectively solved by assuming super uh, symmetry because the super partners cancel this phenomenon in quantum field theory of particle masses to drift to high scales. Now I realize this is a qu quite a technical thing and you might find it very strange as explained, but there's really no simpler explanation. And I think the most convincing thing I can tell you is that billions of dollars have gone behind this argument. Uh, you know, that, uh, that couldn't have been done without a consensus among large number of scientists over a long period. Uh, it is now, after the Higgs discovery, it is now promoted to number one goal of the Large Hadron Collider. And so you may see a news item about this anytime in the next couple of years, or you may not. We don't know. Now, Exact supersymmetry would have required that these quarks should have the same mass as quarks. So electrons should have the same mass as electrons. But if so, we would have certainly seen them by now. So exact supersymmetry cannot be the case. It contradicts experiment. But we can make a kind of, again on my same band of energies, we can make a kind of picture saying, well, if the particles that we know are here at these energies, which is true, and if there are super partners at these energies, then it's this energy range which is sort of protected against being carried over to the right. Okay? So, and this is the energy range. So this is the scale at which forces would be unified. This is the scale at which gravity, quantum gravity becomes strong. But we exist at this scale. We can measure at this scale. And the proposal of supersymmetry is that, well, there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of things we know which are at this energy. And there's a new bunch of things just around the corner. And if you take this graph, and plot where we are with the current accelerators, they are somewhere around here. So they are starting to explore the super partner region if it's there. I emphasize these are theories, they could be false. There could be a completely different explanation uh, for this uh, phenomenon, uh, which doesn't have to do with supersymmetry, and maybe no one's thought of it. Maybe one of you will think of it. Okay? But this is the position right now that this might be the full world as we know it, and that it's stable at relatively low energies because of the supersymmetry between this half and this half. 
you may not be surprised to know that people think dark matter particles lie in this. Hmm? Now, here is an interesting thing. Dark matter is a reality. It is not a speculation. Okay? What is its nature is a speculation, but the particles are reality. Super partners are not a reality. They are entirely speculation. Okay? But it is also interesting that even before we can start to test this region, there is one more reason to believe it, which is that dark matter could be part of this array of super partners. So, the golden scenario, certainly for me and for people who work in my area of physics, is that in five years we would have understood that dark matter particles are super particles and they exist and they complement the known particles via the symmetry or supersymmetry. Okay. Now, one particular thing I will mention if you are interested in precision is that if you really draw these curves, uh, they don't act, where they meet, whether they meet at a point depends a little bit on details of the theory and it turned out that only in the supersymmetric theories this point is really a sharp point. If you don't assume supersymmetry, then these two meet at one point and these two meet at a different point. So, you see that's another little theoretical hint that something is on the right track with this. Okay. Now, I mentioned that the scale associated to gravity called the Planck scale is 10 to the 19 GeV and this is the scale at which quantum gravity becomes important and gravity becomes the strong force. Otherwise, as you know, gravity is a very weak force. The only reason we experience it strongly when we fall down is that there is a massive object which is all, all containing mass which is amplifying the effect of the force. But the gravitational force between two objects like this certainly exists but you can't do an experiment in your lab to measure it. They are actually attracted by gravity, but so weakly that you can't hope to measure it in the lab. Okay. But if we were working at those kind of energies, then gravitational force itself would become uh, strong. And so we should include gravity in our unified theory, which I have not uh, suggested so far. And this is a major problem. In fact, Einstein tried to unify quantum field theory with gravity and he failed because quantum field theory has this structure that two particles come in, interact at a point, propagate and go out. And these points where particles meet, join and split, uh, these are what we call singular points and uh, some kind of inconsistency is developed in a theory which has this kind of structure if you try to include gravity. Actually, these inconsistencies were also faced by people like Feynman when studying electromagnetism, but they were able to sort of get around them for those forces. They are not able to get around them in the case of gravity. So, the only effective solution to this problem that we know today is provided by string theory and I will talk a little now about string theory. In the last uh, 10 minutes, I will talk for 5 minutes about string theory and the other 5 about the ongoing experiments. Now, I just told you that in string theory, the basic objects are strings rather than particles. And let's try to see a little bit what their properties might be like. So here's uh, one category of strings. They are open strings. Here's one which isn't vibrating. Here's one in its vibrational mode. Here's the same string in a higher vibrational mode. Just like a musical instrument, musical string. The same string can vibrate in many different what we call normal modes or frequencies. A closed string can do quite the same. But the characteristic waves that you get for closed and open can be different because here you have open boundaries and here you don't. Now, the interesting thing is that each of these different modes of vibration of a string behaves in all respects like a separate elementary particles. And this was a kind of clash of realization people had about 30 or 40 years ago that, well, this structure might explain the diversity of elementary particles in nature by saying that, well, when the string vibrates one way, then it's an electron. When the same string vibrates a different way, it's a muon or a photon or something else. So this is a single type of string can behave like many species of elementary particles. And analyzing the lowest energy oscillations of the string, it was found that open strings naturally lead to particles of spin 1. And we know that the carriers of three of the four forces have spin 1. These are the photons, the W bosons, and gluons. They all have spin 1 in units of Planck's constant and this is what also strings give you. Moreover, the carriers of gravity, which is a graviton, has spin 2. This we have known since Einstein and closed strings give us spin 2 particles. So, there is a natural uh, outlook for this picture 
that these might be giving us the forces, uh, the three forces in nature that, uh, that we call electromagnetic, weak and strong, and this might give us the fall, which is gravity. And the beauty is that the inconsistency problems uh, that people face when they try to study quantum field theory with gravity are actually gone when we work with quantum string theory and for a reason which is which I can show you in a nice picture. So strings are little loops. These are two incoming strings. Actually they behave like particles but we know in this theory secretly we know that they are strings. When they come together they actually merge in this way, that two of these merge smoothly into a tube like this, which propagates in time and then splits like this. And you notice that in this diagram, there's no short point anywhere here or here where we have to say that two particles suddenly converted into a third one. It's actually remarkable that if you look at this diagram from different sides, turn your head, there'll be different times at which the strings merged. Okay? And it's the smoothness of this picture, which is the deep mathematical reason why string theory is consistent where ordinary quantum field theory was not. <coughs> string theory is intrinsically unified because all force carriers arise from a single species of string and all matter particles are modes of the same string. The interactions are universal and so there's a lot to be said uh, for the structure of this theory and I think most of that has already been said over the last three decades. But there's a price to pay when you have such a nice theory Either it works out of the box, which in this case it doesn't, or you have to understand its problems and string theory has a bunch of issues that people are not fully able to deal with yet and I'll explain what those issues are. So you see, in order to have this level of unification and consistency, the theory, the theoretical structure, the equations are subject to very strong consistency conditions. One of them is very good and very encouraging, which is that strings need supersymmetry. We had earlier proposed supersymmetry to solve a different problem, but if you have ordinary strings which without supersymmetry, uh, then they have another inconsistency which needs to be, uh, which can only be in fact cured as far as we understand by introducing supersymmetry and that's why we don't talk of string theory, we talk of super string theory, the theory of string theory with supersymmetry. And this new motivation which I haven't been able to, which I can't explain to you in detail here uh, is independent, so it's again of a symmetry which was already an idea which could be useful uh, in, in quantum field theory, seems to work even better within strings. The second thing is that strings need higher dimensions. So string, uh, super strings are not in fact consistent in four space time dimensions, but in fact they require 10. And this is very interesting because for a long time people thought, well this means that it's a nice ideal kind of theory but doesn't describe anything of our world. Uh, but it's, a, it's back to the kaluza klein idea which says that, well, there's a basic 10-dimensional world, 9 space dimensions. Six of these could be compact and the shape of this six compact dimensional space would determine the dynamics in our world. So in string theory, one must find a way to compactify the world from 10 to the observed four dimensions in order to make contact with nature. And this has led to what is called the vacuum selection problem due to which this enterprise has been somewhat stuck, I would say, for the last about 10 to 15 years, okay? The question is, how do we determine the nature of these compact dimensions? Uh, mathematicians tell us uh, that there are spaces uh, that can describe these compact dimensions, which are called manifolds, have certain geometric properties, and they offer us many possibilities uh, for such spaces. So here's a kind of fanciful drawing of the kind of space uh, that could be the internal space of string theory. The problem is that uh, there are not just one, but as far as we know, billions of such possibilities. And so the problem in string theory is to determine which one is the right one. And so we don't yet know how to extract a unique answer from string theory uh, for this compact space. And this is what stops us from trying to compare it with details of observed physics. It agrees broadly, I told you that it predicts gravity-like forces, gauge-like forces, it has supersymmetry, it agrees with many broad things, but in order to make a precise prediction, we would need to know what this internal manifold is, and that research is rather stuck at the moment. Okay, so to summarize, the proposal is that superstring theory in 10 dimensions is the correct high energy completion of the standard model. It 
incorporates a lot of new things, but at low energies should reduce to the theory that we know and love. At high energies, it should solve the outstanding puzzles. And so, I, as you see, it incorporates unification, supersymmetry, higher dimensions, and it can describe not only standard model-like forces, but also gravitation. So that's the string proposal. So that's what I call the world of miracles. Now, in the last few minutes, I'd like to talk about the world of magnets. So, of course, you've heard about this uh, experiment, I'm sure. Uh, so, it's been running for the last about five or six years, but it's been switched off since about a year, and will start running in a few months again from now. So, it was it was switched off for an upgrade. It was planned like that: run for about five years, switch off for a couple of years upgrade a lot of things in it, run now at a slightly higher energy and higher luminosity. Luminosity is the energy, is the, is the flux, the amount of flux, if you like, the amount of particles in the beam. Okay? Uh, and it's, um, so this is the aerial view they always show you. In reality, if you, if you fly over this region, you will not see this circle or this thing saying 4.3 km, uh, that's superimposed. But it's, uh, it's quite remarkable, it straddles two countries. And its uh, circumference is, uh, is what? Is about 27 kilometers. So it takes that much time to drive around the whole thing. And it's a collaboration of 2,000 plus businesses from 34 countries, including a very notable uh, section of, uh, of Indian uh, scientists. Uh, I want to mention that ICER Pune, which is where I work now, has recently entered uh, this collaboration, the CMS collaboration. And uh, this place involved us going to or my colleagues going to Geneva and presenting their proposal of what they would do for this uh, experiment. And it, they were accepted about three or four months ago. So we are probably the, one of the latest Indian institutions to be in this experiment. And in fact, uh, particularly one of my colleagues is a specialist on supersymmetry, and she is really working very hard to see if supersymmetry is real or not, and whether its signals can be seen in the next couple of years' operation of the area. Now, what is it actually? What does it do? It's a collider of protons. Protons are quite easy to make. You know that a hydrogen atom is a proton and an electron. So, you remove the electron, what's left is a proton. More or less that simple. Not Actually, it is relatively simple to make protons. It's about probably the easiest particle to make, I think. And it started about seven years ago. Uh, it's being upgraded and it will reach an energy of 7 keV or 7,000 GeV. I hope you can place that in your minds on that band I showed you earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, so total two beams back to back will have 7 plus 7 or total center of mass energy of 14 keV, which is significantly above anything we've probed yet. So whatever, whatever particles are hiding at that energy, whether they fit our theoretical prejudice or not, they'll show up. And that's the beauty. It's housed in an underground tunnel. This is a view inside the tunnel. Uh, so the particles go in through this tube, which is surrounded by uh, magnets which uh, and, and electric fields which propel the particles and curve them so that they travel in this perfect circle. And at various intervals, they're taken off, the beam is diverted, and then uh, the two, so the beams run both in this tunnel, one this way and one that way, obviously in different tubes. And at some point, they are taken off and then made to collide. So each particle typ typically goes round this whole ring several times, getting faster and faster and faster. And then it's taken off and it collides with other particles which are going round the other way. Why do we do this? Well, this is the best way to release any hidden energy. So you have particles which have a GeV of energy each, plus all the energy you added by accelerating them. When they collide, by the rules of quantum field theory, they can split into anything that's allowed by those rules. And if there are any new particles, uh, then at the least they can be produced in pairs. For example, if they are charged, then these new particles will have to be produced one in a plus charge, one minus charge to conserve charge. But you'll get basically a lot of stuff. In fact, a lot of people argued against building this collider, saying that the outcome will be tables and chairs. This was a very strong criticism in the physics community. What they're trying to say is that the outcome is a huge mess and you don't know how to make sense of it. And it's actually very, very interesting if you go into any detail about what they do in this thing. Most of the outcome of smashing protons with protons is absolutely uninteresting. OK? 
okay, most of it, 99.9999%. Uninteresting in the sense we already knew it would be there. So it's uninteresting. The scientists who work calculate what you would expect from the known physics and they subtract it. They call that background. They subtract it from what comes out and then they are looking for that little extra needle in the haystack, which is a new part. Okay. So it's a it, it is a messy it's a messy experiment. It's as messy as you can get because protons are strongly interacting. Each contains three quarks and gluons, and when they smash into each other, it's a it's a huge mess. This stuff I already told you. Um, good. So what is the collider going to find? Because the real answer is we don't know. And that's why we have to do it. You can do any amount of theoretical speculation, calculation, simulation, and so on, but really you don't know till you till it's done. It's not done till it's done. But here are the goals, the stated goals: Higgs particle done, supersymmetry, extra dimensions, dark matter, and CP violation, which I didn't have time to talk to you about, are all goals. And if I give this talk three or four years from now, there may be another tick mark, or there may not be, or there may be two. If supersymmetry and dark matter are the same thing. Then there will be an arrow saying the two are the same thing and a tick mark. It will be beautiful for this kind of knowledge which is today wide open to be updated in my own life. So uh, I'm almost done here. Uh, let me just show you a little diagram of how this experiment could, what this experiment might actually do. So um, how many of you know that protons are made of quarks? You do. Uh, how many of you know that protons are made of gluons as well? So this is a point which has been stressed more in recent times. The old textbooks say a proton is 3 quarks u, u, d. But in fact, since they are bound by strong forces, the more you accelerate them, in fact, the more gluons there are inside them. So two protons colliding at these energies in the LHC are actually mostly gluons. The quarks don't do that much. It's the gluons which do all the work. These are spin 1 force carriers. And when two gluons collide, so here's a little drawing of that. Uh, they can fuse into a third gluon, but this gluon is now highly energetic and it can decay into two gluinos, which are the super partners of the gluon, if supersymmetry is right. Gluinos, however, from what we know, are likely to be unstable. They are strongly interacting like the gluons. Uh, and a gluino could decay into a quark and a squark. Uh, just for those who know, gluons are bosons, so the gluino has to be a fermion. A fermion can decay into another fermion and a boson. Okay, so that's the squark. The squark again would be unstable and decay into a quark and what we call the LSP or lightest supersymmetric particle. And being lightest, uh, due to a certain symmetry of the theory, it may not decay at all and that's the particle we would find. The hope is in fact that's also the particle which makes up dark matter. So this would be that wonderful convergence of solving two problems at one point. So that's the experiment, experimental result people are looking for in the next two years. Uh, the other miracle we might see, I think most people feel that this is much less likely, is extra dimensions. I'll give you an analogy to explain how extra dimensions experiments work, but first let's again see the, uh, the, the diagram. So again gluons, again merge into a gluon, but now it goes into what's called a KK graviton. So that's a mode of the graviton traveling in the extra dimension, the hypothetical extra dimension. And this uh, could be observed, or in, sorry, this, excuse me, this cannot be observed, and that's the reason we would know it, it is there. And so I want to give you this analogy of a billiard table, which I heard from, forget who. Uh, imagine that people thought space is two-dimensional, and they collided billiard balls and looked for conservation of the energy in the form of sound waves, okay? Now, it's true, all the sound waves coming off out of this collision don't propagate on the billiard table, some go up. From the point of view of someone living on the table, they've gone away. So energy conservation is violated. It's not really violated, it's apparently violated by energy going into the extra dimension. Okay? And this is what would happen here. In this process, we would add up all the observed energy, we wouldn't see this because it's a gravitationally interacting particle and so extremely weak. But we would say, well, the energy of this doesn't tally with what it started out to be, and so something is missing, and then we do this repeatedly, there are no, to check there are no errors, 
and if there is missing energy, then that is the signal of extra dimension. It is a possible signal of extra dimension. So, it is quite exciting. Uh, as you may guess, uh, phenomenal precision is required and here are some anecdotes you may have heard. The predecessor of LHC was left the large electron positron collider. It was so sensitive that the readings of the from the detectors were affected by the levels of water in the lake. The lake, mind you, is about 10 kilometers away from CERN. Okay, but you know the water level would affect um, uh, this. The other very interesting story was the uh, fluctuation in electric currents that they saw during a certain period between day and night. So they saw a spike in their detectors four times a day, spaced about four hours apart and nothing at night. Can you guess what that or do you know what that spike was? Okay. So it was the TGV train, the, the high speed train going between Geneva and Paris. There were four in a day in those days and uh, you know they would leave 8 a.m., 12 noon, 4 p.m., 8 p.m. and at that time the electrical current from the train moving on the tracks seeping through the soil to an experiment several kilometers away. Uh, would influence their detectors. So this is the kind of experimental precision you need. Uh, you have to you have to subtract this. this one. By the way, was totally unexpected. They actually didn't know what's going on, and finally, only the fact that it was four times a day and not at night made them think that it might be something happening out in society and not in their experiment. And I told you already that LHC is a mess because the scattering is very messy and mostly consists of known particles. Still, if any new phenomenon exists up to the TEV scale, it should be seen by LHC because it has the luminosity and the energy and physics will never be the same again. And this could be the dawn of a new era uh, in which something like if supersymmetry is confirmed, it would give impetus to string theory as well. Uh, and I think this would be the greatest revolution in physics in at least three decades. A lot of people are betting that supersymmetry won't be found. Then again, a lot of people three years ago or two and a half years ago were betting that the Higgs would not be found. So, you know, until it's found, you can always bet. After it's found, there's no debate. So, that's how it is. I think it's a good time for students to get involved. And I think uh, those who are comfortable with theory and experiment both, that's quite a rarity even today. Um, and even I'm not really one. Uh, I love experiments, but I'm not terribly good at them, as my teacher can probably, probably uh, relate to. Um, but uh, such people will be invited. So, with that, I'll end. Thank you. Experiments require big accelerators. What would the size of the accelerator be for energies as high as 10 to the 19 GeV? Uh, the answer is really nobody knows, but uh, you know it would certainly not fit on Earth. That's very obvious. And uh, in fact, for this reason, the general agreement is that the all the best accelerator there is is the universe itself. And so uh, cosmology. Uh, in which we probe this microwave background that came from the beginning of the universe is the best place to see things which happen at energies 10 to the 19 GeV. Uh, and it's a whole other talk which I sometimes give in other places about what we could hope to understand about this same physics or gravitational physics from such experiments, which are basically probes of space. So the Planck satellite is the thing that's, that's operational. Well, it's no longer operational. They're analyzing their data. BICEP2 is an experiment which was briefly in the news thinking that it had seen a major result of gravitational waves from the early universe, but that result has been withdrawn. The next version of it is out, is due in a week by the way. Uh, so we may know if that's happening, but certainly not on Earth with the technology we know right now. Um, I'll just try to give brief answers because there are many questions. String theory says that particles aren't particles at high energy. How would we be able to describe attributes like mass, etc.? Uh, that's a good question. So basically, uh, the string would behave like a particle located at the center of mass of that string. Okay, for all practical purposes. 
uh, if you know a little mathematics and you, if you heard of Fourier analysis, you can decompose all sound waves into modes of definite frequencies. That's not how you hear them, but if you have a, an analyzer, you can decompose. So it's the same. The string gets decomposed into different particles. There are different modes of that string. So the particle is like a pure frequency. Many particles, if you superimpose, will be like a mixed kind of frequency. Okay. If over the next decade we do not find evidence for supersymmetry, what does that mean for string theory? Bad news. It does mean bad news. <laughs> I think, uh, I think uh, you know, a lot of people don't like this subject because we keep going around giving talks and making grand claims, but we haven't yet shown that this theory is right. Uh, they have a point, but not too much of a point. I mean, the, the thing is, if you agree that if you agree that quantum gravity should be studied and unification is an interesting question, then nobody has a better idea how to do it than this way. If you don't agree, okay, you are on a very sticky wicket. You could say, well, I am a material scientist and I think you should make better polymers and uh, 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 things for transportation, and I completely agree. What I don't get is why that should rule out other people doing what they're doing. I mean, this is not, uh, you know, it's not a zero-sum game and it's not a game where people are assigned what they do. The same person, material scientist, could say, say, I think people shouldn't write poetry, they should do material science. You know, there it would be obviously wrong. So I think this whole business of saying somebody shouldn't do this, they should do that anyway, it doesn't work. So I'm not sure what the fuss is about. But, but funding agencies are different. Now, <laughs> Now, but now the good thing is, you see, that people who work in theoretical particle physics are very cheap. So let's say the entire uh, enterprise of string theory and quantum gravity is a complete massive fraud. You know, the, the loss of money to society is negligible, it's unthinkable. Probably one one magnet of the LHC or something. It's anyway, they, you know, they, one of them blew up. So it's just, a, it's just a risk. You know, so I don't see that it's so bad. but. Being more serious for a moment, it's not encouraging. We do like encouragement. Many of the ideas I mentioned here come together in an encouraging way. And if supersymmetry isn't found, uh, that means a serious speculation of a lot of people, including a lot of string theory people, would have been wrong. Supersymmetry may still be true, but if it's out of reach of the collider, then we start to lose some hope of seeing. Why is gravity ignored in the graph showing unification of forces at 10 to the 17 GV? Very good question. Uh, well, it's a factor of 100 smaller than 10 to the 19. So here is actually where the question lies, that either the forces unify at the scale, Planck scale at 10 to the 19, then you can't ignore gravity, or they unify a little below that, and then that unified force unifies with gravity. These are two possibilities. Uh, nobody knows which one is better or worse, but looks like the first one would have been ideal that all forces unify at 10 to the 19, but in fact they don't. This calculus, this graph I showed you doesn't work yet. And since it's an accurate graph and three lines are meeting, that we have to take 10 to the 17 seriously and hope that somehow gravity can be added later. It is a bit of a mystery. Why can we not experience a fourth physical dimension in everyday life? Uh, precisely if it's compact. Okay. If it's compact, it means that with a macroscopic probe the size of you or me, we cannot hope to access it. It's the same reason why if you are walking on a tightrope, you could not actually go for a stroll around this circle of the tightrope. Okay. Your foot isn't small enough to put little footprints on a tightrope in this direction, but only in this direction. That's why a tightrope is one dimensional to you. If instead of a tightrope I take a huge pipeline, and I make you walk on it, well, you could actually walk this way as well as this way. So that depends on the space being bigger or you being smaller. The smaller you are, the better chance you have of seeing an extra dimension, and smallness in quantum theory is the same as very high energy, because high energy probes have very, very high frequency oscillations, and they, are very, they can resolve very tiny distances. So that's the reason. What do I have to say about interstellar physics, the movie? Yeah, I saw the movie. Uh, it's you know it's a very uh, he's a very major physicist Kip Thorne who uh, consulted for them, and he claimed in the press that this movie doesn't violate any laws of physics. But uh, can I spoil the ending of the movie? Or people still want to see it? Everyone has seen it. So 
So I think he goes back in time and tries to prevent himself doing something. So that's what we call a closed time-like loop, and this is forbidden by the laws of physics. So I think by the end of the movie, he was not really following any laws of physics. Uh, why he ends up behind the bookshelf, I still didn't figure out. <laughs> Why you could communicate only by throwing books out, I couldn't figure out. So that part I was a bit, uh, left a bit cold by that. I think the good part is that all this, uh, the, the black hole and uh, the wormhole actually, uh, that I think they depicted accurately using mathematical equations of this. So as accurately as you can. So it's a nice try. What is meant by spin? Spin is the angular momentum of an elementary particle. And the weird thing is elementary particles behave as if they are spinning, which means they have angular momentum, but you can't actually stop them spinning. So they are not like spinning tops. A spinning top could be spinning fast or slow or not at all. But an electron is always spinning about its axis with a particular value of angular momentum, which can never be changed. So it's a built-in attribute, but it's angular momentum in the sense that you can use a beam of polarized electrons to actually rotate something. If you fire enough electrons all polarized the same way on something, then you will effect a rotation. So you can actually count their angular momentum. Obviously not one electron, but billions together. So its angular momentum, it's basically mysterious, but it's allowed in the theory and it's seen in experiment. So it's a quantum thing, it's not a classical thing. Ah, gluons have little or no mass, how do they produce heavy particles? Um, so actually, um, that's a funny thing. Uh, they don't actually produce heavy particles. So the heavy particles, their their mass, it's not. So neither quarks are heavy, nor gluons are heavy. But protons are much heavier. Protons are heavier than both quarks and gluons. And the reason is the nature of the binding. So that's the strong force is a very paradoxical force. That when you bind. So just let me give you an example. You might know. The hydrogen atom is lighter than one proton and one electron. Okay. The difference is called the binding energy. But in strong interaction, the binding energy is negative, which means the bound thing is heavier than the thing separately. Very weird, but that's how it is. What does the number 3 in SU3 mean? Uh, so SU3 is the unitary group of rotations in three complex dimensions. What it means in physics is that uh, there are three colors of quarks. The quarks are said to come in three varieties called colors, and uh, the 3 of SU3 is the operation that rotates them in a kind of um, abstract space and which is the symmetry of the equations. So that's the thing. If we don't know what dark matter is made of, why do you say they are particles? Well, all matter is made of particles. We don't know how to understand matter if it isn't made of particles. Particles by definition would be the smallest indivisible thing, right? So if dark matter is there, <coughs> dark matter is in this room. That's what experiments tell us, okay? So, there is some dark matter in this region, right? Now, I probe finer and finer, what can it be made of except a bunch of particles? If it's not like that, then uh, we actually don't understand something much more basic. So, you know, that we could come to that conclusion, but every every form of matter is made of particles, that we know. There is no exception. If you want to pursue string theory, what would you recommend as a starting point? So, you know, uh, particle physics is the starting point. So, quantum field theory is the starting point. Uh, so, it's kind of a long road to get to string theory. Uh, there is one nice undergraduate textbook by Zwiebach, a friend of mine. Uh, that's an undergraduate textbook. It introduces string theory nicely. It's relatively easy. And there are popular articles. But if you want to get the hands-on understanding and motivation, you need to do quantum field theory. So uh, the problem was, why are there so many elementary particles? And this question says, well, if I answer that in terms of strings, then I will have the same problem because I will say, why are there only so many modes of vibration of a string? So actually, it's true. The, a string has infinitely many modes of vibration. But if we try to quantize uh, these relativistic superstrings, we find that they have a curious property. Uh, a large number of them are massless as, as part, behave massless like particles. Another number of them behave like super heavy particles and then even heavier and even heavier. So within only within the massless particles, there's a finite number of modes of the string. 
and those are the ones when we say massless we believe that this is an approximation that in some approximation relative to the Planck scale they are massless and some mechanism gives them the different masses that they have. <coughs> so in this sense it's not a mystery that the string has a finite number of light states. It has an infinite number of states but finite number of those would be light. And um, finding that compactification space to predict the low energy theory would answer the question exactly how many modes of the string. So that is answerable. Uh, it is getting more and more difficult to make a physical interpretation of theories in modern physics. Is it that it is okay for the theories to be like this because maybe the universe is fundamentally mathematical? Or should we develop a new method which may or may not be related to present mathematics? So I would hesitate to call the universe fundamentally mathematical. I think what mathematics does is to give us a, a good guess how things may be and then experiment tells us whether things are that way. You see, we always say a theory is no good unless it's confirmed by experiment. This is a correct statement. It's also true that experiment is no good unless it has something to do with some theory. Because otherwise, experimenters have a bunch of observations. What are they going to do? They, experimenters never see the objects we talk about. For example, nobody's seen an electron release picture, a muon or a neutrino. You see some beeps in your detector. What are you going to do with those beeps? Okay, you need a theory for that. So this theory experiment thing is crucial on both sides. Neither you can do experiment just out of the blue, nor theory out of the blue. Uh, I don't think the universe is getting mathematical or the universe is fundamentally mathematical, but theories can be guided by mathematics. Experiments are guided by experimental techniques that people can think of, and the constant unity of these two things is what makes physics. So I think it's not that we will uh, Continue. I don't think I'll be talking, if I'm still alive, I don't think I'll be talking about string theory 20 years from now uh, if there's absolutely no more encouragement. I think we have, you know, another generation may bring it back, but uh, you know, it has to, there has to be some encouraging physical reason to believe, not pure mathematics. And, okay, this is many questions. Um, what is gauge invariance is a nice question. I think let me just answer that as far as, oh, there are more. Okay. I don't know, are people getting bored? I can go on answering, but some people want to leave or something. Gauge invariance. So gauge invariance um, arises from a very peculiar property of relativity. Uh, you see, relativity has this feature that space and time are on the same thing. Okay. Uh, but in fact, the photon, has oscillations in space, but it doesn't oscillate in time. It doesn't have time-like oscillations. That doesn't even mean anything that we know. Something oscillating forwards and backwards in time, no. But you can't write down the theory of a photon unless you incorporate modes which oscillate in both space and time. But then those modes which oscillate in time should not be there. So the theory has to have inside it a invariance or a symmetry which removes those modes as physical modes. Difficult to explain this actually. Once you actually do the math, it's very beautiful. Uh, and gauge invariance is that thing. So gauge invariance is the only chance we have to reconcile the vector nature of photon, the fact that it's a particle which oscillates in spatial and spatial directions, uh, with relativity, which says that in that case time also should come in and it should oscillate in time directions. Gauge invariance solves that in a very subtle way. It has its own history, which is also an interesting subject of a talk. What are strings make, made of? Does this question even mean anything? Very good, very good. That's the right way to ask a question. The answer is simple. No, it doesn't mean anything, but it's still a good question. Because, because look, the electron is a fuzzy object. You go close to it, it's just a fuzzy object quantum fluctuating. What is it made of? It's not a dot. Okay, it's a fuzz. What is the fuzz made of? Nothing. That's the minimal fuzz that we call an electron. Okay? And that total fuzz has a fixed electric charge. There's no part of the electron I can slice off and take away which will have half the electric charge. Okay? It's indivisible, not made up of it. Spin similarly is not made up of anything. That's the fundamental object in string. But it, it won't, it doesn't look like a string. It will look like a kind of fuzz. Good. 
spin 1 particles come from open strings, this is very observant question and spin 2 from closed strings, what about Higgs boson which is if I remember spin 0, you do remember right. So, uh, in um, good question in fact, um, closed strings produce spin 2 and spin 0 particles, that is one, one source, possible source of a Higgs like particle and the other possible source which is more likely is the process of compactification from higher to lower dimensions will produce from spin 2 particles will produce lower spin particles in the lower dimensions. So, it is really in the 10 dimensions that the string gives me the simple answer of spin 2 and spin 1. Uh, when I compactify to lower dimensions, I get other spins. Okay. Why not loop quantum gravity? It does not require higher dimensions. True. Uh, loop quantum gravity from what I understand has two essential problems which, uh, which leave me uh, concerned. Uh, one is that in string theory, it is very easy to take the classical limit of strings propagating in flat space and from it recover ordinary Einstein gravity which we know to be a true theory. In loop quantum gravity, what I have heard from people I talk to is that the classical limit is not obvious or it is not if the classical limit of a theory is not known, that is a bit worrying because then you are not sure. You see, quantum mechanics is not a new theory. It is a deformation of classical theory which breaks down in some region. Similarly, quantum gravity should be a deformation of classical gravity when we go to the ultra high energy region. Okay. So, for me at least this is a more natural approach, but uh, you know, I think loop quantum gravity people should work on and uh, you know, one can compare the results. I do not say one should. Okay. So. Thank you, Professor Murky. That was certainly an illuminating talk on the intersection of experimental and theoretical physics. I especially enjoyed the bit about the beauty and precision of fundamental particles. The personal insights and interesting anecdotes made the talk relatable and enjoyable. On behalf of the Paradigm team, we would like to thank you for taking time out to grace the talk. I would like to call on Ankita to give a small token of our appreciation. <laughs> Finally, I would like to thank the audience for coming. Uh, please remain seated till the speaker leaves the venue. Also, we hope to see you all for the 16th and 17th of the days of Paradigm. Our registration will now be open outside. Thank you. <laughs>